Okay, friends, so here we are together. Welcome to our webinar for the day. Um, it's three o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started right where we are, every place that we're coming from together to think about how to engage in a journey toward justice and literacy for all of our children. Today, we're gonna be talking about the fifth element of the ecosystem, um, of a language rich ecosystem for children, families, teachers, and communities, and how we can plan and teach around an anchor book. So I'm so excited to talk with you. Welcome again to the Cox Campus Year Long Learning Journey as we engage together in this trajectory of thinking about multiple ways and elements that we can develop in our classrooms to make sure we're serving and supporting all children and all families well. I am Terry Fisher-Ari. It's so nice to spend the afternoon with you. This is my 23rd year in education and I'm particularly excited about working alongside of all of you and families and children to really think about how we can create spaces, and ask questions and think about our lives in the world in ways to make more kindness happen. Um, I'm really grateful to be spending today with you and excited to be thinking together and hearing from you and your perspectives about ways that you do this and ways we can do this together. So it's so nice to meet you. We'll be talking more. You'll hear more from me today. But we want to hear who are you? We um, thank you for checking in, letting us know where you're coming from. So we're going to have a poll um, launching in just a second. So you can let us know, are you already a member of Cox Campus? And what is your role um, that you're joining us from, from what perspective? So take a quick second or two and engage in our role so we know who we're um, working with in the room today and who we're learning together with. I see a lot of Cox Campus members. If you're not already a member, it only takes one minute to join, and then you have forever free, really amazing resources to support your planning and teaching um, and working alongside of families and children. So we'll talk more about that. It's good to see who's in the room. We have a lot of teachers, instructional leaders, we have coaches, we have invested family members. We're so excited to be thinking together about ways all of us build spaces for children to be successful. So thank you for being here, every one of you. Thanks for taking a couple minutes to let us know who we all are and what we're doing here together. So Cox Campus exists to create empowering, connecting spaces for us all to try new things, to have engagement with essential, meaningful content that is rewarding and intentionally selected to help us educators all continuously grow. So as we are working together here to live out our core values, we're grateful for the ways that you're joining us in this collective work. Specifically, this is the work of Literacy and Justice for All, which is our vision and our mission and our purpose, as we think about what it means to really ensure that every child, every family, every community is really supported in being their authentic selves and working in the world to make the world kind and to live intentionally. And that literacy is certainly reading and writing, but it's also about how we live, how we then shall live in the world to make it an increasingly kind, joyful, just place for everyone. And so we're going to be really thinking today about the work of living out our vision and how practice, how our planning and our teaching is a way to create this space of working for justice, to challenge oppression, to reshape our world, and to live more intentionally. And how we do that alongside of some of our very youngest citizens, our very youngest learners. Um, and it's very exciting to think about this together. So we're going to work on thinking about how to make this vision and mission realize together as we read, as we engage, as we talk, and we play and sing with children. So today, just to give you a little heads up about where we're going, first, we're going to start with an opening connection, thinking about planning and teaching. We're going to consider specifically what does this element mean? What are the components of it? Take a closer look at ways we can think about ourselves and think about our practice, have some visions and see some planning and teaching modeled for us that we can deconstruct and consider and then think about our own next steps. So this is really moving us to think about what we're doing well, what some strengths are that we can build on, what some resources are that we can take up and what we wanna to choose to do next in our spheres of influence of the world where we're working to support children and families and community. 
So that's where we're headed. So here's your challenge throughout the day. Keep this graphic in mind. This is from School Reform Initiative. It's a really great resource that I use often when I'm thinking about, okay, I'm sitting here in this hour, but what does it mean for me? And so it's an opportunity to think about like, what is this making you think about? How is it making you feel? What do you believe about this? What do you want to see? And then what are some things that you want to do? So it helps us really grapple with the content in ways that matter for our lives and that matter for our practice. So I'm going to challenge you to think about these four components of all of our engagement in the world and what this hour is compelling you to think about, about your own life, about your own practice, your own pedagogy, your own place and space, and your own opportunities um, to read and play and learn alongside of children. So think, feel, believe, and want to do. So if you'll hold on to those questions, I'd really appreciate it because we're going to loop back to this in a minute. Anybody have any questions about this so far and where we're headed? So you might want to jot down these few words or keep them in your heart and head as we engage together today. So as we get connected, um, one thing that's really true is that visual images, visual texts speak to us. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so when you think about planning and teaching and curriculum and designing and even reading books with children, do any of these pictures resonate with you? Does any of them, oh, yeah, this makes me think of this? Or do you make a connection with any of these pictures? If so, drop the number and tell us why this picture is helping you think about planning and teaching and reading books alongside of children. Um, or come off mute and let us know. We'd love to hear. So I'm going to give you a minute or two to drop your note or come off chat. So I see number two about the connection that reading brings. Number nine, about the ways that, you know, we can see the whole world and new perspectives and places through reading a book. I see 13, eight, and nine. I'd love to hear your thoughts, Jennifer, about what, why those specific pictures in 13, eight, and nine are speaking to you. Shana, I hear you saying the number nine is really sitting with you when you think about um, ways that the whole world is more um, reachable and there's more access and information and positivity in a global perspective with reading Mandy about number nine. Again, I see a lot of number nines mattering to people about opening our minds to a whole world of experiences beyond what we've lived. Thank you for coming on. Anybody want to come off mute? Feel free to let me know what you think or drop a comment in the chat. I was going to say something on 10. Please uh, do. I think, I think those are geese. Yes. So um, it's better when we work together to make a difference and to collaborate to make and to share. Also to make sure that there's no child left behind mm. because geese stay together. No one is ever left behind. And um, just unity uh, and strength. Unity, strength, the role of collaboration, of co-planning, of co-working and ensuring that everyone is a part included and not left behind. That is beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Patty, I hear you. Number two really speaks to you when we think about the connection of families. And we're going to talk a lot about the centrality of families um, as we read and think and talk together around books with children. And I see, again, like the way the world focuses on the importance of reading and language um, and how it can open our minds and our imaginations and our worldview and also help us see ourselves. So we're so excited to thank you for helping us activate our thinking about planning, about some of our feelings around planning, the possibilities, the collaboration, um, the inclusivity. It's just very, it's, thank you for setting our path as we think together today. Karenza, I see your hand up. Yeah, hi. I just wanted to speak to number 11. I just thought that that picture is really powerful just because, you know, sometimes, especially in the early learning space, we we don't see the full picture and the trajectory of the small steps that we're making in our children um, to that greater cause of, you know, now they're actually reading. Um, 
And I just really love the fact that it's kind of a gradual um, increments. And then there's this aha, this light bulb. And I feel like teachers see that all the time. But just being patient and being consistent and knowing that we truly are making a difference. That's what I thought about on that picture. That's so beautiful, Karenza. Thank you for sharing that and how small changes made with great love really matter, right? They add up and incremental change is such the way we all grow. Um, So it's so thank you for your insights, for your perspectives, for the ways that you connected. Um, And so we are already setting forth a pathway of thinking about how do we anchor around a shared text to think together collectively, expansively, inclusively. Um, So thank you for joining with me in this opening. Um, As we continue to open, we're going to do some uncovering. So everything that you see on Cox campus, everything that we engage in together is really science-based practices. It's rooted in evidence-based scientific research that looks at early brain development, as you were saying, Carenza, and the role of, of child development, language and literacy development, what we know about teacher development, adult learning theory, about multilingual development and how our children are growing up with complex literacy and language and all that we know about reading and writing research. So everything you see in here, here on Cox is rooted in evidence-based practices and is an opportunity for us to leverage those scientifically based and holistic supports for children as we make sure that we're creating spaces, as you were saying just a minute ago, where every child flourishes, where everyone has what they need to thrive. Those are the adults, the the children, the teachers, the families, and really that we're thinking about building a thriving ecosystem where children themselves thrive, where their voices are centered and their stories are really are really the the work, the curriculum. And so we're so excited to talk with you and think with you more about how to leverage scientific and evidence-based research into daily practices, those small interactions where we're sure that all of us are included. Because essentially what we want is for every child to have their genius cultivated, seen, celebrated, where every classroom is filled with connection and joy, where the wonder of learning and the wonder that every child is, is centered and celebrated. And agency, this idea that all of us have opportunity and we have insights that we can use to change our communities, our classrooms, our relationships, ourselves to make us continuously better and kinder. And so as we work to think about how we can create these spaces for every child to thrive, all of our work is centered around the ideas that every child deserves all of these things every day in the spaces where they live and grow. So what we do here at Cox is we root our work within the nine essential elements that we talk about and think about really deeply as we try to make sure that we're creating those ecosystems, those spaces where children thrive in all of the spaces where they develop. So there are nine elements that we've been talking about across the year and that are really the central part of our work. The first three really are about how do we create a climate where children are fostered and supported and safe, where there is a cultural responsive and sustaining opportunity for them to grow, and where the routines and rituals help them feel seen, help them feel safe, help them feel brave, and engage in the courageous work of learning and growing. The second set of ecosystem elements, really, it's about content. What are we doing alongside of children? So really situating them as our conversational partners, thinking about what does it mean to focus on their emergent literacy, on their um, all of their literate identity, and to do that utilizing an integrated approach to planning and teaching around anchor books, which is what we're really talking about today. So you see the star there on this central element that we're really centering on together. So far this year, you've heard year-long journeys about the previous four elements, and you're going to be having the opportunity in future sessions to think about and deconstruct and grapple more deeply with each of these other elements. So welcome to the mid part of our year-long journey as we think together and know that anything you want to see or dive more deeply into, 
as you were seeing in the chat, there are more resources. You can spend time with those previous webinars and please join us for our future ones. So today we're really talking about content. What are we doing alongside of children? And how are we creating those opportunities for kids to be our conversational partners within spaces that really foster their emergent literacy? The third element, and you really can't deconstruct these. These are all obviously deeply connected to each other, but we do so so we can look at the particulars to create a more generalized space of equity and where all children thrive. The third three are really focused on connections, on how do we make connections between what children are doing, how we're seeing their growth, how are we utilizing observations and progress monitoring, what does it mean to intentionally support our dual language learners and their connections between their literacies and languages, and really how do we build and center our strong partnerships with families. So you're going to see while we're talking about the center one today, we're actually talking about all of them, right? And you're going to see all of these elements coming up as we plan and teach with intention and integrity around books, utilizing the ecosystem. So we're going to talk a lot more about this, but we're going to hone in on the central element and see how it's connected to creating spaces where all children can thrive. The one we're looking at today, as we said, is this guidance document for integrated planning and teaching around an anchor book. So I'm going to ask you to join with me and play a little bit. We're going to do a text rendering. This is from the guidance document. So we built a resource that helps us understand what do we mean by these things? What do they look like? What do they sound like? How do we you know, envision them? What are some clips from Cox that we can see so we can imagine this and keep working on it? Some reflection questions. We're going to talk more about this document today, but let's get started by playing around with it a little bit. There are two paragraphs here, just what is this element and why does it matter? And what I want to challenge you to do is when you read it, I'm going to give you three minutes to read it, any word or phrase or sentence that sticks with you, that resonates with you, that you're like, wow, this matters to me, please drop it in the chat because we're going to create a text rendering, which is basically distilling the things that matter to us that resonate with us from a larger text. And we're going to see what we think collectively planning and teaching around an anchor book is. So I'm going to give you just two minutes, read over it, any words that you like, any phrases that sit with you or strike you, any sentences you're... Um, really wanting to remember, please drop them in the chat and we'll create a new text together. If you're typing, feel free to continue your comment. These are beautiful, y'all, as you think about what really matters to you. If you can scroll up, that's great. Um, but you talked about memorable experiences for children that center developmentally appropriate practices and position families as valuable partners as we build connections with families, partners, and build meaningful opportunities for transformation, for children to advocate for themselves, using repeated reads and extended activities to transform their world through memorable experiences that are meaningful, where, again, children see themselves where their learning is extended, where words and concepts come alive, where there are multiple opportunities for continued engagement and connections across the day that support children developing comprehension and, activity and advocacy and vocabulary, where they communicate and advocate for themselves and make connections, read repeatedly, situate families as partners, and where they see themselves, their culture, and their community in a beautiful way, where families, are our partners. I think we have just defined in some really meaningful ways what matters to us as we think about curriculum, as we think about planning, as we think about what we choose to do alongside of children and why. So I'm really excited to continue thinking with you about resources that we have on Cox and resources that you have and your children are bringing and their families are bringing as we continue to think together today. So thank you for rendering this text and helping us determine what was meaningful to us. And we'll keep thinking about these specific components as we talk about um, the rest of our work together today and dream about what we're going to do together with children tomorrow. So I would love you to play along for just a minute. If you have a favorite book that you've recently read with children, or if you had a favorite book as a child, would you just drop the um, name in the chat? We'd love to hear if there was a book that you really, really love. 
or that you recently, most even today, read with children? It's very participatory. Thank you for playing along. <laughs> Love you forever. Ah, we have Llama Llama, the napping house. There's a hungry caterpillar. We're munching. Dumpling soup. So many. I hear you. Children's librarian with far too many books to, men to mention. So as we think together, oh, there are so many great books out there, right? As we think together about the books that I see Magic Treehouse, and in fact, I hear Magic Treehouse in my house often, um, there are some great books that we share with children um, as we think about all of the books that are beloved to us. There are so many things that are worthwhile talking about, meaningful, intentional literature. Penguin and Pinecone, I need to write that one down. I can't wait to read it. Um, thanks for giving us your recommendations. There are some great books that I can't wait to check out. So snowy day. Mm -hmm. Some of us have been seeing snowy days recently. So there are opportunities for connection. We have Madeline. There's some great books as we think about our own communities, as we think about our own world and our children's experiences. There's if you give them is a cookie, indeed. So there's some there are some books that we would probably say. Oh, yeah, I know that one. I read that one. I do this one. I have this one. Um, and there are so many beautiful books out there. And so part of what we're trying to do together is think about the beautiful books we love and then beautiful books we haven't heard of yet that we might also really love to share with our children. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. There are some great books that I think many of us would say, yes, we have that in our library. Um, and yes, that's a book I love to read with, their ch with the children that I love. And so I'm excited to talk with you about those books and also ways that we can keep thinking about the books that we read and keep adding to our repertoire of the books that we, we most frequently pull off the shelf alongside the children that we care about. So if you take a quick look, this is a resource that was built by the University of Madison, Wisconsin in 2018. So if you take a look at this graphic, what are you thinking? What do you notice? We've actually taken out the percentages to just kind of play a little bit together and think about representation in children's literature. And we think about our own favorite books in children's literature. What do you think your, what do you think the percentages will be? Does anybody have any guesses or estimates of how many times children that are members of these individual identity groups may see themselves in children's literature? Does anybody have any guesses, want to come off mute, drop in a percentage possibility? There's no, you're not given the answers yet, so this is really just a guess. Anybody have any thoughts about how often people, 20% of what do you think, Elena? 20 kids in which group see themselves 20% of the time? I see 20% a couple times. Mandy, what do you think, friends? Who sees themselves in 20% of the books? Anybody feel free to jump off and let me know what you think. 20% of children see themselves represented? Hmm. So mostly animals. So a lot of the books that we named were, we heard about mouse, we heard about the hungry caterpillar. These are books that we love, right? That have messages, but it might be that, you know, that mirror in front of the animal was pretty big, right? Um, and so it could be that a number of our books are about main characters who are animals or who are teapots or who are owl babies. And so let's, we're going to think a little bit about that together, about how do we create spaces where children all see and hear themselves and their languages in the classroom. So I have some 10%, 20%. Let's go ahead and show you the percentages and see what you all think. Does anything strike you here or surprise you or anything that you're not surprised by? Feel free to come off mute, drop in a thought in the chat. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't surprise me, but I think it also depends on what type of school or environment your child go, attends. 
uh, if you your child attends a African American, predominantly African American, I think the showcase of books that look like them are more uh, visible and available because of the teachers are more aware of it today, how important that is in, in literacy. So I think you're highlighting such an important point that teachers make selections of books to be intentional and representative, that this is actually representation of the books that were published that year, right? And so we make the selections out of the books that are published to decide how we can center stories that look and sound like our kids. So your point is so important that teachers and centers and programs are intentionally making decisions to counterbalance the fact that, you know, some of you said, like, I really don't see um, much that surprises me here, though I thought some of the lower numbers, I'm, I'm surprised by 1% being First Nations, Indigenous, American, Indian. I'm not surprised 50% are white. So I'm seeing some interesting um, comments in the chat. And that I think that's really, really interesting to think about, yes, like if this is, these are the books that are published, what choices can we make? Um, and I think you bring up a really great challenge for us there. Thank you. So thank you. In, I'm I, I'm oh, on my gosh. phone. I'm on my phone, and I didn't see the heading, and I was like, "Oh, let me scroll up." Okay, I see it. you're doing great. You're totally doing great. Uh, thanks for being here, and I'm glad we're all here in the ways that we can be, right? Um, and so, what I'd like to do is take a look. This is 2018. So, if you can just hold on to any of these numbers, say you want to look at the fact that animals were 27 percent, or 10% of books centered African-American children as agents, as protagonists in the stories. Just hold on to one of these numbers, maybe 50% white, whatever you want to hold on to in your head. Hold on to that because we're going to look at the more recent numbers. This is a little harder to read, but it shows us change over time. So you can see in 2021, for example, when they most recently did this work, they've changed it a little bit. And to not just look at what who the books are about, but also who wrote those stories, right? Um, am I writing a story that is my own or that is not my own? Is the illustrator writing about a community that they're a part of or writing about it and illustrating a different community? And so I'm, I'm grateful for the fact that now they're looking at not just who books are about, but also who they're by, um, because that's something I think all of us can think about as we select books for representation to make sure people's own stories are being heard and seen. Take a look at this. It's a little tough because it's not percentages anymore, um, but does anything kind of strike you or surprise you? Feel free to drop it in the chat or come off mute. That there might be some increased awareness that people are thinking a little bit more about representation. Um, there are there seem to be more books that are, and when you think about the by and about, who is getting to write whose stories, I think is pretty interesting when we look at the trends across time. There's a lot to deconstruct. There's always a lot to deconstruct when we think about the stories that we read, the stories that we choose, the opportunities that they open for us to have conversation and the, the ways that we can extend and continue to think about questions that matter together alongside of our children, including who sees and hears themselves in the classroom stories. So we will talk more about this and the implications of this um, as we think about like, how do we make choices? What is that gonna look like? You wanna go to the next slide. So what we've tried to do in many of the books that you probably love and that I love are on this slide of, of books that we talk about, that we share, that we love to read with children, um, and that are often people might say they're the canon of early childhood education, right? They're the books that we most often read. So what we've tried to do is we've thought about these really common books, Piggy and Elephant, like, I mean, do you notice anything? Many of our books are centering animals as main characters, right? Um, and so how can we continue to think about like, who are my main characters? Are these anthropomorphized main characters? Are they teapots? Are they, you know, are they elephant and piggy? How can we make sure every child sees and hears themselves as people who make the world better? Um, and, you know, and so that's part of what we've been challenging ourselves to do, to think about 
books that are really written by global majority authors and illustrators with primary characters who change the world to make it better and think about how do we um, really make sure we're selecting complex storylines that give us things to dig into and to grapple with alongside of children that let us lift and elevate the vocabulary across time in meaningful ways and let us plan and integrate our teaching around books. And so we've been really thinking about that and then also being very intentional, as you said earlier, about developmentally appropriate resources. And so as we think about, okay, well, you know, we might be thinking about some of the same questions with infants as we are with, you know, older children, but are we reading books that are really going to foster their curiosity and that are really going to help them develop where they are and that incremental trajectory uh, that Carenza was speaking about. So we're going to talk a little bit about book selection and specifically thinking about how we can create spaces where children hear their own voices and see um, this, their own stories and hear their own language. So part of what we've been doing and up to here at Cox is we've been leveraging these evidence-based practices is to build resources that can be used with any curriculum, any place um, that is a free and forever free open access set of resources where uh, centered around really beautiful children's literature. We've created teachers, like teachers have created this, leaders have created this, researchers um, thinking together about how do we leverage um, really meaningful, beautiful books to have something worthwhile to talk about with children and to be able to plan and teach using those books, building curricular resources. And so um, you'll see the link in the chat. All of the links that are coming in from my colleagues today are gonna be sent to you in a follow-up email along with your certificate for being here as a part of our community today. And so don't worry if you miss something, you will have an opportunity um, to return to some of these resources. But one of the things that you're gonna receive is links to our book list. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, it's rooted really around inquiry questions. So many of us plan and teach. We have Apple Week, we have Plant Week, we have you know weeks that we talk about pumpkins. So we talk about really cool things with kids, but there may not be as many integrating points for them to practice the same types of vocabulary. And so what curriculum research really talks about is how to build spaces for kids to think about things across time, across content area with different books and resources, and how to build a space for conceptual understanding that's deep, for vocabulary development that's deep, for linguistic practices that are deep, and for a coherence to build a mental model. And so what we've actually done is we've taken many of the themes and the motifs and the ideas that are in our classrooms, and we've backed them up just a little bit to think about questions that really matter. Questions that matter if you're four months old, or like, where does my food come from? And how do I engage with the world? Um, they matter if you're four, if you're 44, if you're 104. They're questions about like, how do we live? How do we live together? What you know, what is what is a family? How does a community make sure everybody has what they need? You know, how does the world work? You know, um, and so these inquiry questions really are rooted at the center of our work as we grapple together with things that are not simple to answer, but are worthwhile to continue asking. And so all of our curriculum is rooted around these inquiry questions. And so you're going to see a little bit more of how that rolls out. So each month, there's a specific inquiry question. This is actually December um, when we were thinking about what do we celebrate and why? And are there things we all are grateful for? And then how can we learn from each other's celebrations? And so we have uh, what you see here on the slide is the first part is our centering family resource, which is opportunities for families. Again, like families are the first and most important teachers of our all of our children and to center their stories, their language, their culture, their experiences and really make make the boundary between home and school one that is intentionally broken. And so families sending in stories, sending in videos, sending in resources, sending in experiences, really being centered in the work and then having spaces for the families to connect with each other and with the teacher. And so that's what you'll see in each of these centering family resources that are very doable. I have a six year old, I get lots of, it's about to be the hundredth day of school. Some things are not as doable as, as other things. 
So these are written by teachers and by parents, thinking about what is a viable, meaningful way to practice the conceptual understanding and the vocabulary of, the, of these questions, really, so we can grapple with what we want to be and how we want to act and what we think, feel, believe, and want to do. So in many ways, those same questions I asked you to think about at the beginning of our work together today, are there questions we are talking about with children as we think about, okay, so, you know, does, is there something you want to do as you talk about what you're grateful for? Do you want to thank someone? Do you want to tell them that they matter to you um, in these really important ways to center, again, the creativity, the curiosity, the connection, and the wonder of all of our children? So you'll see... The other thing that you saw there was our book list, and that was also dropped in the chat. This is one of our anchor books, and I'm not going to have enough time to read it to you today, but I would so recommend you look it up. It is a beautiful book um, where the author has actually written the story of his grandmother and um, the way that and, and a, a significant family tradition. And so this is called May Your Life Be Deliciosa, and it's about a grandmother's um, tradition and kind of blessing and hope for her granddaughter and for her family. Um, and it's a multilingual book. It is really lovely. And it is, um, I think, one most of us can connect with and or be challenged by as we think about what do we want our lives to be? What do, what do I want to hope for for my daughter? What, you know, and so there's just so much opportunity to talk about things that matter with beautiful books that matter. So I'm not going to have enough time to talk to you much about this story, but I hope you look it up. And so it's one of the anchor books in our curriculum that is centered around what are we grateful for? How do, what do we celebrate? What can we learn from each other's celebrations? And so with every book, there's a main idea, like a big idea in this book is that the traditions that we share with the people that we love, they connect us and they teach us about life. And then there are focus words that are words that help us understand the story that are in the story or that are really critical for, for making meaning about the story that we have in English and in Spanish with child-friendly definitions and pronunciation guides for people like me who don't speak Spanish fluently, but want to be able to use those words with my students, with my children, to be able to make those connections to their first language. What you'll see on the right-hand side is called a bubble map. And what you notice there, you may have to squint a little bit, and um, but what this is, is an opportunity to think with that book as the anchor with different things that you can do across the week, across the weeks, to connect to families, to learn about them, to try in music and movement, things you can do in dramatic play and shared writing, morning meeting opportunities, times to really engage with children in emergent writing, things, things that you can do to support all of those elements of the ecosystem, specifically connecting to families, supporting DLLs, building their emergent literacy, situating children as conversational partners, really doing this work with culturally responsive and sustaining books to build a safe and responsive classroom. I mean, they're all integrated in the ways that we've been planning. And these are planned by teachers, with teachers, alongside of these beautiful books to think about what is really doable. These aren't impossible things that require massive investments and in, in props and things like that. These are things that we can do already alongside of children in our classrooms every day. Um, and so it's intentional also that there are empty bubbles, as many great ideas as teachers have come up with, there are millions more. And what you'll notice in those bubbles, if you could see them, is that they're bold words and that we're, these are all opportunities to use those key vocabulary across time, across content, to really solidify them in the oral language development of children and their conceptual understandings and to build a complex mental model so they can answer the question for themselves. What do I celebrate and why? What am I grateful for? How can I learn from my friends? How can I learn from my family? What is there that I, I really wanna understand to be able to answer these questions for myself alongside of the people who love me? In addition to the bubble map and the vocabulary and supports for reading the book, we also have dual language learner visuals um, that support the conceptual understanding of the word, because, you know, we talked about pictures worth a thousand words. And so these are great resources to help kids make meaning from the word gather, 
because you see a picture of gathering and you know what it means. Um, and then you, with the translation and the child-friendly definition. So we've provided some resources that go along with each of the book's focal resources to, um, to really make those words come to life. So I'm gonna stop talking and I would love to hear from you all as we think about the curriculum inquiry questions, the way that they're organized, thinking about the selection of the books, thinking about the bubble maps and the focal words and the DLL visuals. What do you notice? What's getting you excited? What might support your efforts to be justice focused and representative? How might you see these as helpful? What do you, what do they inspire you to do or what, what's missing? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Feel free to drop it in the chat or to come off mute. I'll give a little bit of wait time. We'd love any of your thoughts or reflections. inspiring you to create a training opportunity for coaches and teachers to work together. Our planning is always better when we have other hearts and heads too to think of with us. Thank you for sharing. Teacher-created resources are the very best. And as we think about our intentionality, um, it has really been a collaboration from so many educators that have poured heart and, and head into building these resources that are forever free and available for you around all the inquiry questions, all the age band, there's preschool, pre-K, but there's infant toddler older toddler, there is some, and older toddler, infant toddler, just like our, our coursework, they're always built around perfect pairs. So there's fiction and nonfiction and resources that you can read and reread with children as you situate them as your conversational partner. So we're going to watch a quick video of planning and teaching between a dyad of teachers who collaborate together regularly and just listen in to their planning and thinking. So as you watch, what do you notice? What do you see? What do you wonder? Okay. And I looked at the books for upcoming theme on cultures and of, of the books on our list. This is one I really liked. My father's shop. Mm. It takes place in Northern Africa. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, I think, I think it would appeal to a lot of our families. I think there's familiar things to a lot of our families in it. What do you think? Yeah, I think this is a good book. Do you think these markets are kind of similar to what you see around yes. the Middle East also? Uh, yes, I think, yeah, I think in Africa and some parts in the Middle East have this kind of shop. Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll use this book. Okay. Uh, what should our focus words be? Um, so let's do pattern. Okay. Because yeah, the rugs have patterns. Yes. Okay. And imitate. Imitate. Oh, because because our, the roost, everybody imitates the rooster in their yes, own language. Right. That'll be fun. Yeah. And language. Okay. Yeah, because, yeah. you know. The rooster say, um, the rooster say hello in each language, right? Yeah. And our children all speak different languages, different so languages. that's a, a, an important vocabulary word. Yes. What should we use for props? Mm, how about um, a person made of paper? And, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. And a rooster. Okay. Yeah, so. That's good. We don't want many things. Uh, we don't want to bring many things to the children, just simple thing to let them understand the story. Okay. 
Uh, oh, I have some mint in my garden. Yeah, you can bring for a prop. Yeah, I could bring some for your class too. Yeah, um, I think please. they could smell it and, and touch it. It would be that'd be fun. Yeah, smell it and touch it. I like that. All right, let, let's think of so some fun. connected activities. What do you have any ideas for some connected activities we could do? Um, how about um, so bringing? Or printing many kinds of frogs all around the world. And oh yeah, bring pictures. Having, bring That'd be pictures, good. yeah, and uh, make make rugs from this um, wool. Okay. One of my students' mothers actually made rugs in Afghanistan. So wow. um, I don't know. Maybe she has pictures, or she could talk about it. Yes. So I'll, I'll yeah. ask her. Yes, please. How about? Um, so another activity like um, bringing, uh, so like pretending that there is a shop, and with with um, with a person that made of paper. Oh and yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, and we can ask the families to bring things from their cultures. Oh and, yeah, yes. that would be great. Yeah, and have a, a small market in our classes. Right? Maybe you could bring an example. Yeah. So you could say this is from my country, and we yes. can say. So to help the moms understand what we're asking them. Yes, I can do that. Okay, that'd yeah. be good. And what else? What else? Do you have uh, an idea for a song? I don't. Um, yes. Uh, so since this book talking about shop, so I have this song for. Let's go shopping. Let's go shopping. You and me. You and me. Oh, I like that. That's, Let's that's go perfect. to the market. Let's go to the market. You and me. You and me. Perfect. Oh, yeah. That's great. During circle time, we add in greeting the children in their home language. Yes. So when we sing, instead of saying hello to yes. Mohiblo, we say yes. Hel salam. Salam. Yeah. Yeah, that would be perfect. Yeah. That's so nice. Yasmin, are there any children you'd like to talk about for this upcoming unit? Yes, I really want to talk about Yusuf because I know his language is getting better, but he still uh, has a hard time expressing himself. So what I'm going to do is uh, to read this book with him one by one. And since he speaks Arabic and I speak Arabic, I can read this book in, in Arabic and after that ask him questions. Maybe uh, after that he will feel more confidence when he is in a large group of uh, circle time. Yeah. Oh, I, I like that idea. I think I, I only speak English, so I think, I think the idea though of my working with them one-on-one -on -one during the morning time Maybe I could take some of my students who aren't understanding and read yes. with them one on one yeah. and ask them questions separately from the group, giving them more wait time and some more help figuring out the answers so that when we have circle time, they'll be yes. more able to understand the large group instruction. Yes. So, thank you for taking that closer look in um, kind of a peek into the planning and instruction of two of our colleagues. Um, and teachers. So what did you see? What did you notice? Anything you wondered? Um, I'm seeing in the chat that idea of like really connecting into the community and the life of families, um, thinking about support for dual language learners. And are there any things that you saw that you noticed that you wondered that connect to any of the elements or anything that you're thinking about in your practice? Hey, Terry, I just wanted to highlight um, just how wonderful they individualize the instruction, especially at the end when they talked around um, a certain student named Yusuf and kind of front loaded in his home language, you know, um, I believe it was Arabic. And then also the other teacher, I just love the way they bounced off of each other ideas. I mean, it just was, it, you really couldn't differentiate like who was the lead or who's the assistant or what have you, because it was definitely just a really open conversation about ideas. Um, and even how the other teacher said, you know what, I can actually implement that same thing with some of my students and maybe give them more wait time. And so they can comprehend the story more in the larger group. Um, 
I just loved everything. I loved how they connected the parents and, you know, the rug activity. It was it was really a great um, teaching uh, planning session. I think that's such an insightful point that you saw intentional observation and differentiation and support for monitoring progress and thinking about dual language supports and family connections and culturally responsive practices that really you know, helped every child feel safe and be brave. I mean, there you see probably ways that the planning and the instruction really helps us manifest and make real all of those other elements. I'm seeing great comments in the chat. Thank you about like the work to identify the focus words. What words are really essential here? What are some ways that are meaningful for us to extend and utilize those focus words like patterns? like, you know, greeting across the day, across our time together. So they came up with a lot of different activities for across the day. This is not for their book, but this is an example of how they came up with a morning meeting greeting, a song. So they basically constructed a bubble of their own, deciding on the focus words, thinking about what they really wanted to do to, and, and drawing on the stories they knew of the children, the stories they knew of their families and their culture, a mom, who made rugs in Afghanistan, families, ways of greeting and connecting, and ways to really brainstorm that that permeable boundary between home and school and all of our languages and literacies. So they together really built an integrated plan to utilize to teach around an anchor book that they intentionally selected because they thought it would resonate with their children and look and sound like stories of connection, of creativity, of joy. So that intentionality, right? And also the idea generation of the collaboration. When we, Whenever we have someone to think about and reflect with, we're always better. And so these are some of the resources from our guidance document that I really, I love. As a teacher, as an educator, as a coach, as a collaborator, I love reflection questions that help me think about myself and help me think about ways that I can continue to grapple with my practice and grapple alongside the people I care about and, and continue to grow because we're all still growing. So as you take a look at this set of questions, is there anything here that is resonating with you as a question you would love to consider more with somebody that cares about you and cares about your practice? So you can just drop the number or come off, the, off mute and let us know if there's a question that you're like, I want to think more about this. This would be a meaningful and fruitful conversation with somebody who knows me and knows my teaching and knows what I believe in. <clears throat> I see number four about how we can leverage these anchor books to create multiple opportunities for inquiry with children. Thank you for sharing, Vanessa. Rosalind, I see number seven about really looking at the, the ways we can notice children utilizing and taking up those key vocabulary, those anchor ideas, the concepts, the main idea in their own life. How do we make those connections and then observe and notice and support? See number six, about really partnering intentionally with families to support those connections with the topic, the inquiry, and those family connection resources are really exciting um, as we think about. And they're in English and Spanish and multiple resources um, are. And so, those resources are really helpful too, as you think about ways that you can grapple with these questions that matter to you and to your practice today. So spend some time with the guidance document. The link has been dropped a couple of times and think about areas that you wanna work on and learn about. And specifically the um, one part of the guidance document that's really helpful is like, what does this look like? Like, how can I, if I have that question, what are some things I can aim for, think about, grapple with specifically in my practice? So these are practices that are in that same document to just help us think about small steps, just like that visual about these small steps toward new great ideas. These are small actionable steps that help you as you think about the questions you're grappling with and the areas that you wanna focus on in your own practice alongside of children and families and community. So as we wrap up, y'all, this has been a fast hour. Think, we, I ask you to think about what is this making you think about? How is it making you feel? What do you believe to be true? What do you want to do next? 
So we're going to think about those four questions again. Hopefully you've been keeping them in your heart and head as we've been grappling together. And we're going to move into this final couple of slides so about this specifically. So the next slide really asks us to think about what's one thing we might do and who might we share some of these resources with, the questions we're trying to wonder about with, some of the practices, the curricular resources. What's one thing you might do or who's someone you might share it with? Please come off mute, drop in the chat, however you'd like to be um, sharing out your thoughts as we engage in this kind of closing circle. And they just posted the blog in the chat. It's another process, it's a process step to support you in selecting an anchor book and all of the work around deciding on focus words. So it, and then how to implement a bubble map idea plan and then take it into your practice. So hopefully this will also be a really great resource for you. Any next steps or someone you want to share this with? Hopefully, whether you're typing in the chat, thinking it in your heart, um, making plans or texting a friend for when you can plan together or think about some of these reflection questions, we're all taking up new ideas about who we can share this with to realize justice. Um, exciting staff meeting shares, opportunities to connect. And as you see on the next slide, we're really hopeful that if you are um, that you're continuing this year long journey with us. These are the dates for our next sessions, like I said, around the, the additional anchor elements of our ecosystem. Um, so mark your calendar. We can't wait to see you here as we continue to think about how to ensure every child thrives. It's exciting to see these next steps populating in our chat box. And our next slide, if you are not already a member of Cox Campus, it will literally take you one minute. And so, there's a poll that will populate for you to give us some feedback so we can continue to also grow. And then the next slide will give you a reminder to sign up for Cox, where all of these resources, all of the links that you've received, everything is forever free um, in order for all of us, teachers, families, partners, communities, children, um, to continue to work toward literacy and justice for all. I see lots of people you plan to share with. Rosalind, I saw your hand up. I typed yeah. it in the I typed it in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, friend. So if you are not, if you're already a member of Cox and you're already a member of our larger community. So stay in touch with us there. Um, you'll see on the next couple of slides again a reminder to be apart, ask questions, reach out, let us know your successes. We're excited to be on this journey, this year long and forever long journey toward realizing literacy and justice for all of our children and for all of us. Thank you so much for joining today. It has been a pleasure to spend an hour with you. We're grateful for your time, for your feedback, for your insights, and especially for your leadership as you work to make Literacy and justice real alongside of families in your community every day, alongside of children in your classrooms. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure and an honor to spend an hour with you. May the rest of your day be joyful. And I can't wait to connect with you in our upcoming year-long journeys. Thank you friends so much for being here. Again, you will receive a certificate of attendance along with the resources from today and all of the links. It's been a real great honor to be with all of you as we think about integrating our planning and our teaching rooted in science and evidence-based practices to ensure every child thrives. So join us to continue the conversation in our upcoming year-long journeys and please be in touch.
Thanks for being part of the community. And thanks for being part of the change toward justice.